evening. My name is Suzanne Lynch. I'm co-author of Politico's Brussels Playbook, the daily newsletter bringing you all the news and analysis each weekday morning from Brussels. Thank you very much uh, for joining us for this evening's Politico live event. Um, marking International Women's Day, we've decided to look at themes of power, of politics, of trying to get behind some of the big names in Brussels and some of the female leaders uh, that we know uh, on TV, through reading, but try and, try and get to, to behind what really uh, what really they feel about their own careers and some of the challenges they've seen over the years. Um, first of all, um, we will start with some housekeeping remarks. We'd like to thank our sponsor, McKinsey & Company, for making the event possible, and also our visibility partner, Women Political Leaders, and of course to all you online. Um, we'll be hearing from a range of speakers, including Nadia, uh, Cal Nadia Calvino, the first Deputy Prime Minister and Ministry of Economy and Digitalisation for Spain, and we will have an interview uh, a little bit later on. Uh, we're also hoping to make this event as interactive as possible, so you can participate by tweeting, as always, uh, using the hashtag at uh, Politico IWD, at Live Politico. We're also, and this is very important, we're running a live poll on Slido, and we're very eager to hear your uh, thoughts on the question, what is the best tool to ensure gender equality in the public and private sector? We will bring you those results at the end of the event. So before we get started uh, into our interviews and films, uh, we're going to first hear some opening remarks from our partner, McKinsey & Company. Um, we will be hearing from Maria Del Mar Martinez, Senior Partner and Chief Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Officer based in Madrid, as well as some senior representatives. I'm Maria Del Mar Martinez, a Senior Partner in McKinsey's Madrid office and the Global Head of our firm's Diversity, Equity and Inclusion programmes. Europe leads the world in gender parity. But as Sofa Gate showed, we still clearly are not where we want to be. In Europe today, only two in every 10 executives is a woman. And only four in every 10 managers is a woman. We must do better. Europe has the opportunity to set the standards on gender parity, as we have for privacy, and for environmental protection. But <laughs> we know Europe is a big and diverse place. One size does not fit all. Some regions will choose to have the governments take charge, and some will choose to have companies take the forefront. In all cases, we at McKinsey look for three things to ensure success. One is that the top leaders in business and the political sphere must commit to gender parity. Two is that the public and the private sector must work together so there's transparency and accountability on the progress. And three, individuals in every workplace need to open up opportunities for women to advance. I'll turn now to Sandra Sancier Sultan, a senior partner of our Paris office. Tell us how institutions make sure that women are included in every step and why this is important. We know how much diversity means to a company's performance to its EBITDA, but the impact goes deeper than that. Did you know, for instance, that companies with more than 30% of women on their boards have 1.5 times higher environmental scores than those with no women? So it's clear, European companies need more women to embrace growth, to embrace the opportunities of the future. At the same time, the bar is rising. New generations are demanding an inclusive culture where they can bring their full selves to work. And that means embracing diversity in all forms. So to achieve the gains we see from gender equality, we need to create more inclusive working environments. Companies will need to double down both on their ambition, but also on their actions towards diversity. Thank you, Sandra. So to help women lead, we need companies to create more inclusive environments. But it doesn't matter if workplaces are inclusive, if women aren't even in the pipeline to begin with. To that end, I will pass it now to Solveig Hieronymus, a senior partner in our Munich office. Solveig leads our firm's thinking on future of work in Europe. Solveig, hello. 
Let's talk about jobs in the future and the EU recovery plan. Can you tell us a bit about why it's important that women are in the pipeline and how to get there? Look, Maria, before I get to this, I would like to point out that European unity has probably never more important and made a bigger difference than the past couple of days and by now weeks. When Europe decides to act together and stand together, it has real impact and is decisive in its actions. From that comes opportunity. Also, when we think more holistically, for instance, as we recover also from the COVID crisis, the European Union's recovery facility, more than 750 billion euros in size, a historic instrument, actually is there to reset our economies, our lives and livelihoods with a dedicated focus on both sustainability and digitization for the continent. This is great because it's so topical and has a real opportunity. However, when you look at the current facts, there's also a challenge in it when it becomes, comes to women. Not even 20%, so one in five of the engineers we need to make sustainability transformation happen are today women. Same holds true or even slightly worse for the software professions. When you look at today's software engineers, less than 20% are women in today's jobs. So it's very important as we craft also recovery going forward and the uh, industries of the future and employment of the future that we think uh, gender equality and also the advancement of women in those sectors which will be driving European growth and European employment going forward. Thank you, Solve. Throughout my career at McKinsey, I'm often asked what women can do on a personal level to advance their careers. So I would like to close with the advice I wish it had been given as a young professional woman. And here it is. One, be good at what you do and be known for something. Focus on your strengths and build them. Two, find sponsors and accept that they might change as your career progresses. The person who championed you before maternity leave might not champion you after, and that's okay. And finally, don't let anyone take away your confidence. You know what you're capable of. If you work hard and are strategic, people will recognize your contribution. Don't worry too much about making others proud. Make yourself proud. Thank you very much for that. Now, before we get to our main interview of the evening with Nadia Calvino, which we just recorded just before coming on air, we're first going to share with you uh, another uh, video. Uh, our Politico's chief correspondent, Sarah Wheaton, she sat down with three well-known female figures just near us here in Parc saint Contenere in a very gloriously sunny uh, weather, unusually. And she spoke to them about their experiences uh, in, the, in the workplace over the years. Um, as you will see in this video, uh, the interview takes place on a sofa. This is a reference to Sofagate, uh, the, uh, the incident whereby the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen was sidelined at a diplomatic event in Turkey and was forced to sit on a sofa while the two men in the room took the more prominent chairs. Um, so uh, we are very pleased uh, to share with you this video that was shot um, and we're going to pass you now over to Sarah Wheaton. If you are ready. Hi, I'm Sarah Wheaton, Politico's Chief Policy Correspondent. I'm here in a little bit of a sunny Parc saint Contenere. We're sitting here on a sofa to evoke the infamous sofa gate. And we are here to talk about um, the trials and tribulations of women leaders in the European arena. Can you bring us somewhere to somewhere, a moment in your history when you actually experienced your Sofagate moment? I remember in my first executive position, I was traveling around to meet in different countries, the people who were reporting to me, and I got to uh, one of the Nordic countries, in fact, and um, I was walking around looking for the offices, saw a few guys coming uh, into, and they walked into a room, and one of them looks out and say, uh, the coffee hasn't arrived, would you please bring the coffee? 
yes, where's the coffee? I say, like, <laughs> so he said, it's just next door. And I walk into this small kitchen and I, uh, there is like a small thing with uh, cookies and everything ready. And you just need to pull the, the coffee in the, in the coffee pot. And I did and I put it and I rolled it in and I sat down and say, hello, here's the coffee. I'm Cecilia. <laughs> and they realized that I was the new boss. Uh, and of course, super embarrassing for them, but for me, actually a little bit funny. I mean, <laughs> Sometimes it happens. You give an interview, there is a public event, there are men, leading men, there are leading women, there is a lot of TV and a lot of uh, press around you, and then you see that there are two, three men standing next to me, being also in an important position on what they are doing, simply going out with the elbow, pushing you out of the picture. And this is something when you just experience, you think, no, it's not possible, so we are all civilized people. My sofa gate, I think, is a lot about this day-to-day -day ordinary sexism that often doesn't get called out and you don't realize anymore, but it actually hurts. I've been, for instance, in panels, uh, being the only women, and you know, I've taken the opportunity to say, well, that's not normal. And it depends. Sometimes you can get challenged. Sometimes there's a dialogue, you know, that starts to, to really try to improve that. You're far stronger if you're united. So women's networks are absolutely important. I'm a big fan of quota, of binding measures, and this has to do with more women in economic uh, power positions, more women in political power positions. We still carry some historical views on women compared to men that's very hard to break. And it's only breakable through uh, making different leadership and show the way for, for other leaders to do so the same. Many of the American companies have actually changed that because they measure their leader on diversity. Mm. And what you measure, you get. Unfortunately, many of the European corporates have not followed at the same speed. We need to transform the way we are using power. It's called feminist leadership. And it's ultimately exactly about transforming our societies. And for me, it's also dismantling patriarchy because that's what I would like to see happening you know in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. What advice would you have for ambitious young women who want to be influential but you know are seeing what's happening to you seeing what happened to President von der Leyen and, and feeling a bit intimidated? I often think about uh, the little girl that I was you know I was a bit rebellious I was always challenging the status quo in school and in many places and it gives me a lot of strength, you know. Think about the little girl you were and the aspiration and the expectation she had. What I recommend, especially to young women and also to young men, be angry and to all have fun with feminism. All women's rights, uh, they are not given. They are really to be defended and uh, we have to be very active in order to progress. Learn by watching uh, role models, work with people who uh, enables you to grow and of course be able to also take the choices at the right time that will bring you there and then sometimes also just like do the hard work yeah yeah <laughs>Thank you, Sarah, for that video. Fascinating insight into uh, some of the challenges, the everyday sexism uh, that some very well-known women uh, find in their career. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, we're now coming to our keynote event, and I'm delighted to be joined by Nadia Calvino. She's first Deputy Prime Minister of Spain and Minister of Economy and Digitalization. So thank you very much uh, for being with us, Minister. Great to have you here. Um, just to start off, um, you famously said, and I'm going to quote, I will never again be in a photo in which I am the only woman. I will not take part again in a debate in which I am the only woman. Can that, that went viral. Um, can you tell us a bit more about why you said that? You know, where was that impulse coming from? <laughs> yes, it's right to say it was an impulse because I hadn't thought uh, of talking about that in that in that special event. It's true that I've been for the last 30 years working in areas which are mainly uh, male and so I've been the only woman in the room many times and I thought we were making progress but now with the pandemic and uh, and the other successive crises that we're we're suffering I am a bit concerned that we may be losing the focus on the need to visualize, to give, give a voice and, and put a face to 50% of the population as women. And so I reacted like that. And indeed, that has already helped me to uh, add more women to the conversation in a number of events. 
Yeah, I mean, do you think it's important to have that 50-50 representation? I mean, we're here on this event now. It's two women, it's 100% women um, during this conversation. But do you think it's it's important to have that 50-50 balance? I think what's important is that we have a fair representation. I wouldn't say it has to be 50-50 always, but definitely we have to set ourselves some targets and the, the objective overall should be to have a 50-50 um, but in, in general terms, you know, I wouldn't be uh, saying we have to have these kind of quotas in each and every one of the panels or the discussions. But overall, you know, I was noticing that in the last couple of years, we have relaxed uh, from this point of view. And I was more and more often seeing myself as the only woman in an event, the only woman in, in a photo with other 15 or 20 persons. And I just thought enough is enough. Mm. Of course, your own career has been so interesting. You had senior roles in the European Commission before becoming a a politician being tapped as a Spanish finance minister. You, know, you were deputy director general for for years and in different DGs and director general. So, I mean, do you think the European Commission as an institution, do you, do, over your career, did you see a lot of changes, more women coming in or, or how has it changed? Oh, definitely. When I joined the European Commission, there were very few women. Uh, even less with, with family that were in, in leading positions. But there was a strong determination on the side of the, of the president of the commission and, uh, and the top management to change that. There was a very determined action. And I think that the share of women that now are in leading position has increased very significantly in the last uh, 10, 15 years. And that is a very good news, obviously. Yeah, as you mentioned there, the European Union is leading compared to some other countries in terms of having women in these top jobs, head of the Commission, the President of the Parliament, the ECB. But I suppose like every corner, every part of society, it has to trickle down also. It's not all about who's at the top. But in saying that, I mean, the, your own government, I believe, you're, you, you, you have a very a strong representation of women in the Spanish government. Indeed, uh, with the three vice presidents, we're, we're women and a majority of ministers are, are women. But the thing I like the most is when President Sanchez is asked, he says, I didn't do it on purpose. I was just looking for the best. And I think that that, uh, that is the way to go, you know, to think that we have to have equal opportunities and then we can shine just as, as good as any man can. Yeah. Um, and I mean, again, the video we heard earlier on, people talking about advice. I mean, would you have any advice on this International Women's Day for women in their professional career? I mean, what would you say to women who want to progress, who want to get up to the top of the ladder? What would your any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, throughout my career, I've been confronted with many brilliant women that thought they were not ready to take a leadership, a leading position, or that that would be too costly from the personal point of view. Uh, what I would tell younger women is trust yourself, you know, be self-assured. You're just as good as any other person and you can do it if you try and if you're determined to get to wherever you want to, to reach, you know. And uh, more and more, I think that women feel empowered and able to be become uh, astronaut or, or vice president of a government or president of the European Commission. And having leading role models is also very important in this regard. Yeah, it's tr true. Even though these, these role models at the top of institutions, you know, are so important in terms of, of setting a precedent and setting a sense of normality around, around things. Um, we had some questions earlier on that came on this issue saying, um, you know, I suppose we're, we're, we started a poll at the beginning of this session about, you know, how, how best to tackle gender inequality, really. Um, but one of the questions is, you know, um, the pay gap. Now, I know you're in the, in the public sector, as it were, but I mean, do you think that's a big issue in the corporate world, uh, the pay gap between men and women? What could we do to uh, address that? It is a big issue and it uh, permeates throughout the whole economy and it also goes throughout our whole working lives. And at the end of the day, it also leads to a pension gap. And actually we were discussing this today in our, in our government's meeting because we were taking stock of a report we, we adopted on the um, gender gap in pension payments because we have taken measures for the last uh, almost four years to try to reduce this gender gap, this pay gap with good, with good successful results. 
results. We have reduced this pay gap and it's around 16% right now. It's 6% when we consider full-time equivalent jobs. I think Spain is right now one of the countries with the smallest uh, pay gap. And we have also acted to reduce the pension gap uh, with measures to ensure that there is a rebalancing at the end of the career, which is also leading to a reduction of this gap. So I think indeed that through legislation and with a determined policy, we can reduce this gap and we can improve uh, the, the uh, fairness of our societies at the end of the day. Acting also on more structural elements such as education, uh, uh, digital skills right now, and uh, making companies aware of the need to ensure this equal treatment of women and men as an element of their competitiveness too. Yeah, it's interesting. It, it, it probably links into one of the other questions we received, which was, uh, was the pandemic a missed opportunity for women? And if so, how do we make sure the recovery isn't a missed opportunity for women? Absolutely. The pandemic has hit women uh, much more comparatively uh, for many reasons. We are at the forefront in the health sector, also in the care sector professionally, also at home. Uh, also, the sectors that were more directly hit, such as hospitality, tourism, have a, a higher share of women working in those sectors. And that's why we have uh, really put as a top priority of our recovery plan, gender equality. We think that we need to make sure that women do have a leading role in the recovery recovery. And we are also taking other measures such as the increase of the minimum wage, which have a comparatively more important impact on women and the young, two of the parts of our society that have been more severely hit by the previous financial crisis and the pandemic now. And our whole recovery plan has a number of programs which are specifically targeting women, for example, in terms of digital skills or startup uh, support which should have an impact and should continue to push and to drive this uh, equal opportunities agenda, which is so important uh, looking forward. That's interesting. So because part of your well, your, your jobs, ma your main function is, is running uh, the, the, the Spanish economy with your government and implementing that huge uh, recovery fund and that recovery money. Uh, that try to help countries out of, of the pandemic. Um, and, and what you're saying there is that some of those policy decisions were, were had a gender uh, element, essentially. I mean, I know you're an economist by training, but that idea of either specifically or indirectly adopting measures that will ultimately benefit women. Well, but it's it's purely rationale. You know, it's, it's, it's not only a matter of fairness and social fairness, it's a matter of economic rationality because many studies uh, suggest or, or uh, estimate that uh, the Spanish GDP could increase by as much as 18% if we close the gender gap. We have also seen throughout the 40 odd years of, of our democracy in Spain that one of the drivers of modernization and change of the Spanish society has been the participation of women in economy, in businesses, in politics, in society in general. And so we're quite persuaded that uh, we need to invest in, in the education of women, in the participation of women, in the new uh, digital economy. We need to ensure that the uh, female uh, engine, you know, continues to be one of the engines for growth and prosperity in our country going forward. Yeah, interesting, because as we know, in, in, in every country and also at an EU level, a lot of the huge, huge decisions about how a country was run during the pandemic were taken a lot of the time by a certain sector uh, of society, not just gender, but in terms of class, uh, racial diversity, etc. Uh, people making huge decisions about people's lives. So it's good to have as diverse a representation when it comes to, to decision making as possible. Um, I just wanted to ask some some more specific things about your, I mean, you're known here in Brussels, a lot of people watching this um, will be EU bubble watchers and you all obviously will be well known to some of them from your, your long and illustrious career at the Commission across the road here at the Berlimont, uh, but also more recently as, as Spanish finance minister. Um, one of the issues, look, I mean, we are meeting here today with this situation, this war in Ukraine that has changed everything. It feels like it has changed everything here in Brussels. Every policy area is being affected now. Um, 
I just wanted to maybe get your your thoughts uh, on the issue of energy. Now, I was covering Eurogroups back in the autumn, I think it was in Luxembourg, and you were there making very strong statements about energy back then. So Spain was one of the leading proponents uh, of a more robust uh, response from the EU towards uh, rising energy costs. Um, where do you read things now? I mean, look, that was a few months before this Russian invasion, but would like to get your thoughts on, on the energy situation facing Europe at the moment. Yes, indeed. Spain was, to a certain extent, the first one to feel that this was uh, this was a very serious issue, the, the spike in energy prices in, in international markets. Because of the way our national market works, it is extremely elastic. And so the moment there is a price increase in international energy markets, it trickles down immediately to retail prices. And so it was already a big issue in the past, and now it's become uh, untenable uh, due to the, to the aggression on, on Ukraine. And so we have been pushing uh, the institutions and other uh, partnering member states to react in a decisive manner. And I'm happy to see you know, that the Commission today has issued a, a communication that already is putting on the table some of the proposals that we have been uh, proposing and putting on the table and pressing for for, for the last uh, weeks and months. Uh, because, frankly, we have to act on the short run to isolate our national markets from the spike, in particular of gas prices, and so from Putin's uh, policies uh, to a certain extent. And we also have to take measures uh, to uh, reinforce our strategic autonomy. And this means we have to be much more efficient in terms of energy consumption. And we have to press ahead with Fit for 55, ensuring that we have as high a share of renewables in our energy mix as, as possible. In that regard, Spain is, is starting from an advantageous position. Around one third of the regasification capacity, capacity of the EU is in Spain. We also have a high percentage of renewables, around 50% of our energy mix is renewables already. And we have a very diversified uh, gas and oil supply uh, portfolio. But uh, we uh, still see the need to decouple our uh, energy, uh, our electricity prices from the increase in international gas markets, because otherwise we won't be able to, to succeed in having a fair transition and having society with, uh, with us in this in these, uh, very important structural transformation of our energy markets. And then, you know, as you seem to, as you're, as you're suggesting there, there seems to be now, as we meet, as we talk now here today, a, a tension between the, the long-term needs for Europe. Everyone knows we need to wean our way off Russian gas. It should have been done a long time ago. And yet the short term issue now, that's in the short term. You mentioned about decoupling. I mean, anything else specifically you would like to see the Commission come forward with? Well, I think from the short run perspective, we not we need to revise our energy regulations so as to ensure that we do have the agility and the flexibility to react right now and ensure that our citizens benefit from the uh, renewables that we already have in our energy markets. This is the cleanest and the cheapest electricity possible. And so they shouldn't be paying the very high gas prices due to the, to the uh, Russian aggression because of an inappropriate uh, energy regulation right now. And then from a more mid-run perspective, I think it is very wise to try to profit from the fact that Spain has a very uh, large regasification capacity, but we cannot export the gas uh, to France and then ultimately Germany and North and Eastern uh, European countries because of the lack of appropriate interconnection. So I think it is very good also that the European Commission is, is pushing for a fast uh, increase of our electricity and gas interconnectors because we need to have the right infrastructure so as to have also strategic autonomy uh, throughout Europe. What about issues like joint negotiation on gas contracts? Is that something you support? Yes, absolutely. We did propose it already uh, some months ago. It was already something that we thought was needed. We need to speak with one voice. We have seen through the pandemic how speaking with one voice and acting together has enabled us to have access, access to the vaccines, just to give you a clear example. 
Likewise, we think we should speak with one voice vis-a-vis -vis the energy suppliers throughout the world. And it is also very good that we reinforce our strategic um, um, deposits, that we have uh, appropriate infrastructure so as to store gas, to store oil and the other uh, strategic supplies, so that by next uh, autumn, we are in a very good position to withstand any comparable uh, geopolitical tensions as the ones we're living right now. Wow. Yeah, I'm. One of, I mean, what I really want to ask you is, is what it's like being around the Eurogroup table and the the dynamics, the personalities around that table. But I know you're not going to really uh, disclose too much. But I mean, one interesting uh, aspect of this is um, last year, and I suppose it's an example one could say of the idea of influence and how it's not. It doesn't have to be gendered, but how one exerts influence. You were one of the early supporters of the idea of, of common debt issuance, um, which eventually was um, adopted. Um, maybe talk a bit about that. I mean, were you? Did you re really think that the EU would, would come around to that, or um, were you quite surprised in the end? Well, I think it is remarkable and uh, it is a step change. It is a fundamental uh, change in the way Europe works that we had such a decisive, uh, uh, such a such a strong response to the pandemic and that we were united at that time. And that was last spring. And I have to say that everybody around the table understood that this was a very serious situation, that we were all on the same boat and we had to provide a united response. This meant coordinating our national responses and then at the, at the second stage, devising this very ambitious recovery plan, unprecedented recovery plan. We agreed to borrow together so as to invest together in our shared priorities. Uh, this is really very important. And I have to say that all member states, including those that maybe were a bit more reluctant in the past, were very supportive and were instrumental to reaching that agreement. Uh, I have to really pay tribute to, to Chancellor Schultz because he was the, the finance minister at that point in time, and he really helped uh, for the first time having financial support for furlough schemes, short work, uh, short term, term work schemes. And so an EU that protects citizens and not only financial institutions, uh, also a Europe that protects uh, governments and allows us to, to have the fiscal space to react, and then the recovery plan. And I think this uh, has ensured that we are having a very different exit from this crisis as compared to the previous financial crisis, of course. And there are now talks uh, of maybe further common bonds to finance energy and defence. Would Spain support that idea? I heard the rumor, but I'd rather first see what exactly we're we're talking about. This is a there are a number of discussions that are crisscrossing right now. Also, we're discussing the review of our fiscal rules. Uh, how how is the recovery plan implemented? Uh, you know, how is it going to be evolving in the future? How are we going to to face the the needs to upgrade our our defense expenditure? But I I think we have to first see what proposals are on the table and then reflect uh, broadly on the different options that are being uh, currently discussed. Okay, but not ruling it out at the moment anyway, before you see the, see the uh, proposal. And on the broad up fiscal rules, that's another huge uh, theme for the European Union, for the ECOFIN and, and Eurogroup. Um, what about suggestions of a more flexible fiscal rules policy? Are you in favour of that? I think that the most important thing, uh, the most important principle to bear in mind is to try to avoid going back to the debates of the past. I think it's very important that we do not go back to the old trenches, which were traditionally putting uh, north and south in different buckets or, or large and small member states or east and west or, you know, you name it. I think right now, again, it's very clear that we're on the same boat and we need to, to face the challenges of the future, but also the present, together, we will need to undertake massive investments in the green and digital transitions. We are now seeing we also need to upgrade our defense expenditure. I wouldn't put that in the same in the same uh, group, but there are uh, very important needs uh, for the future, and we need to ensure that we face them together. 
united we are stronger we're seeing it uh, every day and so we should avoid going back to these uh, discussions of the past we're working very closely with france italy portugal greece also with germany with the netherlands with finland and i think this sort of kind of more horizontal approach starting from the principles that i think we share should be the right approach when facing these very difficult debates and yeah, I mean, the reality is we remember 10 years ago with the euro crisis, um, the reality was Europe was very divided and the countries in the north, let's face it, you know, got their way. It was a policy of austerity and that was that was the that was the policy. Um, so do you think, you know, it's time now we are just after coming back to, through this huge, this kind of opposite approach, if you like, you know, providing this extra money for the European economy to get it through. So would you support um, a, a move to recognise investment when they're looking at uh, these, these fiscal rules? I think we, we all agree on two basic principles. One is that our debt uh, sustainability uh, and debt consolidation strategy has to be growth friendly, has to support strong growth and job creation. And secondly, that any strategy and any, any uh, uh, rules that we devise have to be fit for purpose. They have to enable the European economy to face the massive public investments that are needed in this green transition, etc. These two principles, I think, are shared, and this should be the starting point on, on any debate, uh, because uh, we really had to make sure that we uh, design rules which are fit for the coming 20 years. And definitely we need to avoid the mistakes of the past. And, and if we look at the way, for example, the Spanish economy has underinvested for a decade, has seen inequalities rise uh, after the financial crisis, has seen uh, massive you know, imbalances that were not corrected because we didn't have uh, strong growth and job creation in the past. I think that that shows the, the road we shouldn't uh, choose again. Uh, but rather choose the road that allows us to have uh, fiscal responsibility to consolidate our debt to GDP ratios and also our deficit to GDP ratios, uh, taking into account the need to sustain strong, uh, sustainable and, and fair growth going forward. Um, how worried are you about inflation at the moment? I am worried. I am very worried. I am very worried about price increases, energy price increases, I mean. And that is why we have been urging the European, our European partners to decouple the evolution of international gas prices from electricity prices down, downstream. Because this has to do with the welfare of European citizens and families. It also has to do with the competitiveness of European companies. So I am worried not so much about the number. I mean, in, inflation, the rebound in inflation would was a, a normal um, uh, was something to be expected when we have such a strong recovery and also we're comparing with the very stable prices of, of last year and during the pandemic and even before the pandemic so we shouldn't be surprised by a price spike but obviously now the underlying causes and in particular the spike in energy prices and raw materials that is worrying and we need to to tackle it as soon as possible so as to avoid that we engage in a wise in a, in a price spiral that can lead to a more structural inflationary problem. Mm. And one of the one of the possible responses you mentioned there is decoupling that that would help tackle that 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 problem. What about the role of the ECB? Do you think it's been too delayed in try in in taking action uh, to try and and tackle inflation the way other central banks across the world have? No, I think the European Central Bank really has been instrumental when responding to the pandemic, ensuring a strong recovery, and right now is instrumental to, to ensure financial stability in a context which is marked by instability in so many other areas. No, I think that we need to ensure this decoupling in terms of energy prices. We need to reinforce our strategic autonomy when it comes to uh, essential inputs, for example, chips and, in, uh, and semiconductors, and, and, and we have to look into the other roles materials and intermediate uh, uh, goods that are essential for European industry. And then at the national level, only yesterday, we had a first meeting with the social partners who have behaved very responsibly uh, throughout the pandemic. We have had many agreements with, with them, where notably the, the most recent is the labor market reform. And we want to work together with them in a, an incomes agreement that would uh, ensure 
that we do not uh, trickle, uh, we, we do not trigger uh, a, um, a wage uh, rent uh, price spiral that can lead to a more structural impact uh, in, in terms of prices. I have to say this was a very constructive first uh, encounter and we will be working with them in, in the coming weeks to ensure to provide uh, confidence and reassurance to citizens, but also to businesses in our country. Final question. We're coming to an end now. Um, again, the topic du jour, if you like, uh, there is now talk of further sanctions are coming this week. Uh, Commissioner Dombrovskis, in an interview with us uh, on Monday, con confirmed that. Um, do you think energy now needs to be part of uh, the next European sanctions package? Would Spain support that? Well, generally, we have been very supportive of uh, strong, effective sanctions. Uh, this has been our approach. We are also, uh, our, our response and our interventions, you know, in the different councils has been, have been marked by solidarity. This time around, Spain is, is one of the least exposed countries to, to this crisis in terms of our exposure to gas and energy dependency, in terms of also trade dependency. Uh, we are not one of the neighboring uh, countries at the frontier. And so we have offered our full solidarity to our European partners in terms of, so of work welcoming refugees. We have already established three hubs in Spain. We have a very good experience when it came to, to also um, other situations, other crises in, in recent uh, months, uh, for example, in Afghanistan. And so we want to provide our, our help and our knowledge and, and skills to ensure that we can be effective in welcoming the, the uh, massive uh, person, uh, people's flows that are expected as a, as a result of this uh, crisis. And likewise, we will be supportive of uh, actions to ensure that this war ends as soon as possible. I think this is our shared objective. This is our top priority. And, uh, and we will do our utmost to, to help the EU respond in an effective manner uh, to, to stop a war in, at our borders. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Minister Calvino, for joining us. We had a really fascinating to hear your views. Thank you again. Thank you to you and all the best to all those watching us today. And thank you very much to Minister Calvino for joining us on what's a very busy time for us all in Europe, um, us all in national capitals, and of course the people of Ukraine are in our thoughts all the time uh, at this awful moment. Uh, I think the Minister made some very good points, uh, particularly about the, the need for an energy transition. Uh, Europe's uh, dependency on, on Russian oil and gas is an issue now very much occupying minds here. So very uh, good to get her insights and some suggestions there. So thank you very much to the Minister. Uh, before we finish up, I just want to turn to the poll I mentioned at the beginning of the evening. Uh, just to remind you, it asked, what is the best tool to ensure gender equality in the public and private sector? Uh, we had four options, better family leave policies, mentorship programmes, quotas and nothing. Things are getting better on their own. Now, as you will see there, no surprises that nothing only got 2%, um, but, but pretty, pretty um, well balanced. But yeah, better family leave policies. It's that age old issue uh, that we've been hearing for decades still has not been properly addressed. But that is the that is the main issue, uh, according to our respondents to this poll. Mentorship programmes, another uh, another very important strand uh, and I think a lot more companies, institutions, public and private are uh, introducing those mentorship programmes to, to bring women up um, and quotas. 29% uh, believe that quotas are needed uh, and are the best tool to ensure gender equality in both the public and private sector. For, so thank you very much everyone who participated in that and thanks again to everyone to join for joining us. Uh, we want to thank our partners McKinsey and Company and our visibility partner Women political leaders for their support for this event. We always invite our audience to give feedback. Uh, the email address is live at politico.eu. That's live, L-I-V-E, at politico.eu. And you can also check our website, politico.eu, for all our latest events and our political live uh, events that happen throughout the year. So with that, I'd like to say thanks again. I'm Suzanne Lynch, co-author of Politico Brussels Playbook. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of this International Women's Day.